Thank you very much. Uh, I'm slightly disappointed when we were waiting off in the corner. Um, Stephen, or Professor, as I like to call him, <laughs> said, I hope they've got chairs, otherwise I might start rapping. So it made me think maybe we should have got rid of the chairs and just see how you did this. I'm not sure how well that would have gone down here. <laughs> so, so, I guess we've Hello, seen... Hello, by the way. Yeah. I guess we've seen a lot of stories, particularly recently, and I've got two kids, 15 and 17, about the anxieties and the pressures that social media is bringing to mental health mm -hmm. and the issues that this generation is facing. Yeah. This is something that you've dealt with personally, uh, you know, and you've spoken about that extensively. Yeah. Could you talk a bit about your, your discoveries and your struggles in that um, area? Okay, so my first introduction to, to mental health, I used to hear the word mental chucked about loads when I was a kid. I used to use it, not really realizing you know, what was attached to that word. Um, you know, he's mental, she's mental, but the phrase mental health was never something that I heard when I was a kid. Um, when I was 24, my dad took his own life um, and there began my journey into mental health and being more self-aware myself um, and for ages trying to understand why he did what he did and I quite quickly realized that the only way I'd ever understand how he was able to take his own life was if I was in that situation myself and never wanting to be there. Um, later on you know I became a successful musician and all the musicians that I loved growing up put a bit of themselves into their music. And for me, I always wrote from personal experience. It was, I suppose, cathartic. Um, and I wrote a song which spoke about my dad's suicide, which then opened up this conversation about his suicide, which put, you know, I wasn't really ready for. The song was really successful. Um, it doesn't really sound like a successful pop song, does it? A song about someone's suicide. Um, but then I was put into situations, you know, not dissimilar to this, where I had to discuss it. And I realised how important that discussion was because of how many people would reach out after, you know, they'd heard certain interviews. And I later did a programme called Suicide of Me for BBC, the BBC, which, again, it was really bittersweet because the response was so positive and, and huge. But the only reason it, there was such a huge response was because so many people were either directly affected by the issues that were raised and investigated or they'd seen someone suffer from those problems themselves. Um, and I think now more than ever, we have, there's, there's more dialogue, you know, there's more open conversation about mental health than there ever has been, which has to be a positive thing because, you know, first comes awareness, after that, hopefully, you know, comes understanding and there may be some resolve. But I think the scary thing about the situation we're in is despite all the open conversation and me sitting here and talking to you all as openly as I am about mental health, my dad's struggles, my struggles, um, the fact that I feel quite anxious right now, um, statistically things aren't getting better. So it's, it's trying to action things and put people in places where people need the support, in schools, in hospitals, in workplaces, you know, and making people, especially, especially men, because it's still the largest killer of, you know, not even men, you're still a boy at the age of 15, but from the age of 15 to 50, the largest killer of men is suicide. And that stems from mental health issues, which largely comes from us being so far behind women as far as expressing ourselves and feeling safe in doing so. And uh, you have, you know, you've walked the talk in that you talk often on social media in particular about the things that have happened since that moment, since you began to enter into that sphere. And you've talked about, you know, I've seen pictures of operation scars that you've had and the, and the resulting depression that followed. And has that been helpful to you or has it mainly been about helping other people? Um, it's a weird one because for me it's quite difficult. I have to learn to, and I, it's, if you think about how, it, I think it's just as a societal problem. Like there's, there's, a, there's something that I, I, I'm really perplexed by, properly confused by nowadays, and I never realised it before. Like, if I was upset, someone would always tell me to cheer up. I'm sure everyone's had that, right? If you're upset, the first thing someone says, and they don't mean wrong by it, but the first thing they'll say is, come on, cheer up. You know, if you're not smiling, you know, if you look down, it's like, why are you so upset? Cheer up. That teaches you to be inauthentic with how you feel. And that's at the very grassroots of the problem, is we're encouraged from a very, very young age to not be honest about how we feel and to be authentic with our emotions. Um, so for me, it, in a sense, it's, it's been cathartic through, by way of 
songwriting, I suppose, but talking about it less so because what I get is a lot of people come to me with their problems. And at that point, I'm really, it's difficult because it would be irresponsible for me to try and help someone with those problems beyond directing them to someone that can give them the help that they need because I'm not a qualified psychotherapist or psychologist or a professor. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you've also written a lot about um, toxic masculinity and you referenced mm. a little earlier there about men's struggles to catch up with women in emotional yeah. terms. What, uh, you know, kid from Hackney, what was your experience of masculinity and what, what's your critique? Um, well, my critique was, you know, be a man from the age of a very young boy, be a man, be a man. But what is it to be a man? No one ever says what being a man is, you know? And what is it to be a man? I find what's difficult is actually, irrespective of, of gender, you know, whether you're male or female, people generally just want you to be whatever they need you to be at any given time. So it's never just one thing. Um, it, it's so difficult. As a kid, you're just told to be a man. What is that, to not cry? you know, to be hard, and there's a very, very big difference between being hard and being strong. You can be hard and be resilient to get through something, but being strong is being authentic with how you feel, and being honest with how you feel, and being aware of your weaknesses. I think that's where real strength comes from, and that's not being hard. You know, being strong is being able to be vulnerable because that's something that we all are. Two people can go through the same situation and one of them will cry and one of them will put a face on it, and you will see the person who's crying as the one who's been affected. But actually the person who's not, you know, the person who's got the stern face, who's got the hard face, who is seemingly unaffected is equally, if not more affected, because they're not being honest with how they feel. And what, you know, where that ends up is either, you know, at the pub, four pints in, punching someone because that's where their emotions come out, or it ends where my dad's life did, with them taking their own life because they can't tolerate how they feel anymore. And I think that's, across my journey, what I've learned, the difference between someone who will take that final step and someone who won't is the, abil the ability to tolerate how you feel at any given time. And what do you think we can do, I mean, on a social level, on a personal level, but what, what do you think government, society, institutions can do to help? It's such a huge, huge question. And I feel like I've, like, it's funny, like, because I feel like almost in certain situations, if you ask a question, you're not entitled to without having the answer. You know, you're persecuted for it. God forbid you question something that you feel is wrong or anything that you see as an injustice in society without having the answer or the fix when there is a whole team of people called the government who are meant to be able to solve those solutions. Um, but as far as just, listen, I'm no fucking Gandhi, all right? But <laughs> let's get that, yeah? Um, and I'm still, I'm still a work in progress. And one thing I notice, no matter, you know, from what walk of life, no matter, you know, from where people come, all I've, I've really realized is that we're all bloody winging it. So if I was to give one piece of advice, really, is just to, to be a little bit more honest with yourselves and to be a little bit more open to other people's feelings, really. And to, yeah, that's about as peace and love as I get. <laughs> so I, uh, a couple of years ago, my niece committed suicide at the age of 27, and so it was a very traumatic time for the family. We were trying to work out, in retrospect, what we could have done, how we could have seen what was happening, what a uh, family or, you, could, you know, how you could get involved for the best. Do you have any advice, everyone in this room, what, what can we do, either for ourselves or for our loved ones, that might make a change to our, our mental health or the end result? It's so difficult because, you know, I went through the same process with my dad. What could I have done? What could anyone have done? And there's a very small window when someone makes that decision. And it's quite often when there is no one around, people tend to make that decision on their own and without making people aware. So I think, sadly, there's always going to be people that slip through the net. Um, I think what we can do, really, is just... It does come down to just making it more OK for people to express how they feel at any given time. And that's really difficult because, you know, even when you spoke about the operation that I had last year, I didn't want to tell people the severity of the complications because I was worried about losing work. Because if I lose work, I can't pay my mortgage. You know, so how can you go to someone in your, in your workplace and say, I'm depressed and I'm that? Like, you're not, you're trying to, on one hand, you're trying to progress in your life and your career. On the other, you're suffering and you're struggling. But you don't want to tell anyone that because that might affect your ability to progress in your life, in your career. It's really difficult. So until we have honest and open spaces where people can admit 
However, like I feel shit today, and it's got nothing to do with this. This hasn't contributed to it. This is actually bringing me up a little bit. But I woke up and I felt pretty shit today. And we all too often just put, and we have to put a face on. I think there is a balance, because if you, you want to get anything done, you do. Sometimes you have just got to pick yourself up and get on with it. But I think we need to find a better balance between being honest with how we feel at any given time and that mask that we wear, which enables us to, to plough on through. Uh, my daughter's 15 and 17, very active on social media. On the one hand, it seems that they discuss and understand things a little more. But on the other hand, it seems it brings in anxieties and stresses and pressures. Do you have any strongly held view on the positive or negatives of your engagement with social media? Yeah, well, I think so. I, I had a really good discussion with a pal of mine, Gizzy, about this. And we were talking about body image and the effects that social media has has had on people's, and the way people see themselves, and obviously with the ability to alter how they look before they put pictures up. I was at a party the other night, and I took a picture of me and two friends, and the girl in the picture said, you're the first person I've ever seen take a picture directly to Instagram, what are you doing? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? She obviously was talking about touching up pictures. Um, but Gizzy made a really valid point in the discussion that we had, in that her mum had the same anxieties, and she didn't have Instagram. We all just have good and bad days. You know, nothing can change that substantially in your body image over 24 hours. But yet you can wake up and feel fine one morning and the next day look in the mirror and think you feel like shit. So I don't think, I mean, there's a lot, you know, that's said about the negative aspects of social media, but I think it goes beyond that. I think it's more just intrinsically what we are as humans and the fact that just some days you're going to look at yourself and see something completely different to what you'll see the next. It feels to me to some extent like the, the younger generation people, even longer, younger than you, are starting to think differently and talk differently about this. Do you have any optimism about us having the conversations we need to have in the future? Um, I am optimistic and I think, you know, and forgive me for saying this, but I, our only hope really is in the children. And that's where we should be putting our efforts and our time. I think that's, you know, that's, that's the real chance of change. Um, and I'm, yeah, I weirdly am quite optimistic because normally my manager who's over there would tell you anyone here that I'm the most pessimistic person <laughs> in the world. Um, but yeah, I am quite optimistic. Although something I worry about with the heightened awareness is, you know, is there a point where people become too aware and find problems where there aren't any? It's a, it's a, yeah, it's, I mean, balance is key to everything and I think it's always going to be extremely difficult to strike that balance. But I think we're moving towards hopefully a, a more open and friendlier space. And finally, do you, I mean, to our, open that conversation, either us talking to someone else or us hearing, listening to someone else, do you have any tips on how to make it work, how to, how to cross, you know, break the face down and tell the truth? Um, if you're on the other side of it and you're asking the question, uh, I had a funny conversation this morning while recording a podcast, and um, Sam Manawa, who's a poet, we're talking about um, grieving, and he just made the point of, you know, everyone says, hello, how are you? And he thinks, you know, do you really want the burden of that? Like, are you really invested in this conversation as much as I am? Because I'm about to tell you how I am, and this is going to take a very long fucking time. Um, and I said, well, maybe people should just stick to saying hello then. Because all too often, and it is, it's the most common line we all tell every day. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm sweet. On. On as we go. Um, so I guess really is just if you're going to ask someone if they're all right, be prepared to listen and don't tell them how they should feel. Let them feel however they feel and be open to whatever they say. Good advice. Thank you very much indeed. Cheers. Thank you.